Hi everyone. Um, so we are here for the panel on uh, structuring the deal and uh, on the MNN finance terms. So we have uh, Edouard Ribou from uh, Euraseo, uh, Henri Capel uh, from <laughs> Apax, <Sorry>. and Hans Georg <laughs> Dingenheim from Hengeler. And no, Henri is not from Hengeler either. <laughs> and Florence from my uh, so you can put the, the first slide so that uh, we start with, uh, with the presentation of, uh, of our panel, uh, with the start, uh, with the uh, quick introduction on uh, the overview of the current uh, private equity uh, environment. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, when we were preparing this panel, actually, we tried to to think about the key trends we were seeing in the industry, and this is what we've tried to put on, on this slide. Um, interestingly enough, uh, you know, if you compare the COVID crisis to the 2008 crisis, I mean, the main difference is that the, mar the market has remained really active. And I think most of us, I think, start to say that we've worked more for in the past 12 to 18 months than we never did in our entire professional life. And, and, and the number of deals uh, that, that went on uh, and, and, and were, were amazing. And actually it's, uh, it's, it was really a surprise, I think from a private equity investor point of view uh, to see that level of activity. Then, uh, I mean, my personal experience is that when, when what happened in the last few months is that uh, there has been a, a very important polarity uh, between two types of assets. Um, so the one that have not been negatively impacted by COVID-19 outbreak, or sometimes positively impacted, like, you know, healthcare companies, tech companies, the processes around those assets were crazy, very fast, uh, at very high valuation. And there was, you know, some somehow, of, you know, a, a, it, it, the, the game was really, I will, I will say, even uh, more speed than it was in the past and with valuation get, getting to a very high level. And then you had companies of good quality, but that have been negatively impacted by the COVID-19 outbreak. And here we've seen, I mean, some deal happened, but it was more, I would say, in a bilateral way. Uh, and with, you know, longer processes, uh, longer time for, for the... For, for, for the deal for the deal to happen after our initial phase I would say in last March April April or nothing happened um, what what uh, what we've seen uh, is that um, on, on those assets especially the one that were a bit impacted we, we've seen a lot of creativity uh, around uh, around how the deal was structured. Uh, and, and especially personally, I, I've done uh, um, two uh, deals, one in, in, in March 2020 and another one in, uh, in, in January, uh, where it was add-ons and, and important build-ups for, for some of my portfolio companies. And given the uncertainty around the recovery, because all the point is about when is going the business to recover at the level where it was before. And that's all the, you know, that's one of the dollar question. And a good way, what we've seen is that a good way to cover that risk uh, was actually to enter into some kind either vendor loan earn out mechanism. And, you know, I think that uh, Henry, uh, Hans and Florence can, can come back on that later to share their own experience. Uh, but clearly we see more and more of those. And I think there is, I, I think also from the seller point of view, there is a merit in accepting, you know, a, a short term, uh, a short term earn out, for instance, because if they believe in the recovery of the business, then they might have an additional upside. Uh, whereas for the buyer, I mean, it's such a leap of faith sometimes to enter, you know, into this kind of, uh, you know, 100% deal. I mean, with the, the price being paid uh, upfront, that you know, it can help the transaction to happen. I would say that the, the last point, uh, you know, as an introduction, and, and Henry will, will share his own view on that as well, that I would like to raise, is the fact that there have been a lot of activities, but at the same time, we've seen uh, people, the fundraising uh, still at very high level. We've seen uh, the, uh, the, you know, some new competition from the SPACs uh, in the US, 
uh, and we might see them uh, in Europe. So there is more than ever uh, a scarcity of assets uh, in our in our in our in our uh, in the in the P market, and at the same time, so you have scarcity of assets of good quality, and you have uh, more and more money in the system. And so the natural, um, you know, the natural consequence of that is that people tend to stay in their deals or to reinvest in their deals. So exit were not pushed because I think you know that sellers saw a value in securing in securing a part of the investment, but a lot of them, and including uh, Eurasio, of course, uh, decided to stay and to reinvest with a new vehicle. And for instance. I, I, I've been, you know, uh, um, working on a transaction called Questel in France. It's a, it's a software and services uh, product for, for the intellectual property market uh, industry. And it was owned by IK. And, and, and so we, we, we bought the business uh, in November or December 2020. So the company was not affected by COVID. It's a, you know, it's a great market, the IP market. And IK decided to reinvest alongside us. And so we are in a co-control, so it's a 50-50 deal, and they decided to reinvest with a, with a, with a new vehicle. And I think it's, a, and this is one transaction, but I'm sure, Henry, you have other ones, uh, but Quested is a good example uh, of, uh, of this trend, which I think is quite interesting for, for the future of the industry. Yes, thank so you, and I think it's, uh, it's completely in line with what we've seen at Apex. Um, if I, if, if I rewind a bit, uh, 12 months ago, everybody was thinking, uh, you no, know, this would happen. And then uh, uh, things started to, to normalize and even accelerate. And as you said, uh, especially on tech and healthcare deals that we do quite a lot uh, at Apex, uh, given the scarcity of assets and the capital that has continued to be raised by private equity players, uh, there is a tendency to uh, want to stay in the businesses. And a good example also is what we've seen uh, at APAX on Experio, which was the 2018 deals. Uh, we had no sale planned at all. Uh, it was a relatively recent deal that we closed back in 2018. And we entered into bilateral, uh, bilateral um, discussion, completely unsolicited by a private equity player based in the UK, Vitruvian. And we decided, uh, while it's not really what we do on a, uh, generally, to stay in the business. Because on the one hand, we were able to secure very high valuation, there is the investment, uh, give back money to the investors, etc. But on the other hand, uh, we need to, to keep capital deployed in good assets that we know, that we know that are uh, recurring, resilient to the COVID, etc. So we decided to keep a significant share of the, of the of the capital, and it is more and more common in the current environment. Edouard, you've worked on, a, on, on the Questel. It is a very good example, but you have many others. We've seen GI software, we've seen IEAD trading with the same kind of uh, structuring, whereby the, the sellers want to stay in the business uh, with the same, the same fund and maybe moving from one fund to the other uh, because they continue to see the potential of the, of, of the business. And this is, I think, we, we had before the COVID crisis, some case like that, but it is more and more structural and it triggers a new thing, I think, in the processes that we, we structure is that somehow you need to prepare in advance uh, shareholder agreements, uh, co-control uh, clauses, and also uh, make sure that you will be able to work quite properly with the new shareholder it's not always the case. You need to have a good understanding of the of the of the next phase of the business, uh, but it works in general. Uh, and this is the clear tendency we see uh, these days. Uh, thank you, uh, Edouard and uh, Henri, for this uh, for this introduction. I think we can switch to the next slide. Uh, which goes a little bit more into the, the different provisions uh, that we have seen uh, over the past uh, year and that are linked to um, the COVID situation. So the first one, um, and maybe you can, I don't know if you can move to the next slide um, or not. <laughs> uh, and uh, the first one that we discussed a little bit uh, with Edouard is uh, indeed the price mechanism. So 
um, clearly deals are, are still based on, uh, on lockbox mechanism, and, uh, and I'm not sure we moved from that, uh, except in a very specific circumstances. But what we have seen more and more for the assets uh, of the second category, meaning assets that have been impacted by COVID, is uh, the return, I would say, of the earnout uh, mechanism, which was something that we uh, did not see uh, much anymore. Uh, because it's quite complicated to implement, but it's also a very, a very um, a useful um, tool to uh, indeed um, um, make the bridge uh, to uh, for and and uh, and the path for recovery and uh, and uh, negotiate a price that is acceptable to the purchaser for an asset that has been impacted by COVID while. Uh, giving uh, some of the upside uh, on the VP uh, and on recovery to the seller and making the bridge between uh, the, the well uh, the economics that, that are expected by the seller and the risk that the purchaser is taking. Uh, in the structuring of uh, an earnout, it's always a little bit complicated, but uh, quite interesting because you need uh, to ring fence uh, the perimeter of the of the earnout, which is not uh, quite easy, especially uh, if uh, the earnout is uh, is on a, a kind of long term, because you cannot uh, restructure or merge uh, the activity with new activities. So uh, it's uh, all it's easier to structure over a short period of time. I would say one to two years after if it's longer than two years, it became a little bit more complicated to structure. Uh, I don't know, uh, Edouard or Henri, if you had, had the same experience. Um, so, no, maybe if, 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 I, if I can comment on that, I think earnouts as a private equity seller, we don't like that. <laughs> so we try to resist <laughs> as much as we can on that. I think what we've seen, and, I, and, and, and that is also, I think, Edouard, what you've seen uh, on your side, on build-ups and consolidation strategies, it is true that we are pushing a bit on that uh, front. Uh, it is also a way to secure management uh, of the acquired company and to keep them invested and interested on the, on the, on the, <laughs> on the performance and to make sure that the business plans they are selling I mean, they, they are incentivized to, to, to deliver on it. It is true that be, beyond two years, it's complex uh, because somehow it, it prevents you to, 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 to properly integrate businesses. You can have bias of, uh, of, uh, of management, uh, but it is true that you see more and more that, uh, especially in the build-up context. Yeah, I j just to add on that, I fully agree with what Henry just said. I think I think the earnouts are trying are trying to cover two types of risk. The first risk is um, the time of recovery on a on a business that didn't perform well, and and that is really linked to I would say, uh, for instance, travel or for instance, you know, things like that. And I agree that it, it fully it it's it's a plot it's a plot it flies essentially on add-ons, but sometimes you want to cover something else. You know, most and you know, now we're evaluating, evaluating company on, on uh, next 12 months EBITDA. You know, in the past, it was, you know, the last actual EBITDA, then the LTM, and they, now it's the next 12 months. So when you're evaluate, evaluating a business on the next 12 months, and you are in January or February, <laughs> then you might want, you know, to have a bit of comfort about, you know, a bit more comfort on the current trading. So, for instance, on one important add-on for Questel, we've negotiated a, a very short, a super short amount. So a six months amount. So we, we closed the deal, we signed the deal in December 2020 for the, for the add-on. And the amount was based on the H1 2021 results. So a six months amount or one year amount. So it, it, it has two merits. First of all, from a seller perspective, it makes them in control. They, 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 they are the feeling that they are more in control of the results. Uh, so they are not going to, to, you know, we're not, we're not going, the buyer is not going to behave uh, in bad faith. And the second, uh, and, and then it's, it's much shorter time, time frame. So it's uh, the likelihood of it being paid is, uh, is, uh, is, is higher. So uh, yeah, that's, that's what we've seen. Just one observation from the German side. I, I think we have a clear preference for when the rollovers as, as opposed to earnouts if you're buying from a sole proprietor 
Um, because earnouts, you know, just as it was mentioned before, regardless how they are structured, you know, they always give room to, for, to manipulate. And the, the vendor rollover is certainly a, a tool which we, which we have seen a lot during the financial crisis some 10 years ago, and you see it more again now. And there's also, and it was mentioned elsewhere, that the, um, the sellers, you know, they, they would like to participate in the upside. And also in terms, you know, a lot of sales, you know, they don't have, they don't have really have use of the of the funds received to deploy them. So that there's another reason, you know, why they would like to stay in in the business, and that is something which uh, we see more and more uh, in the most in the most recent transactions. Thank you, uh, Hensi, and uh, and uh, and to tell you agree with you. Um, Switch, switching to the to the other provision that uh, that we've seen in recent transaction and that are linked to uh, uh, the COVID situation, first uh, is around the lock, the long stop date, uh, and um, as you know, in in a, in a very seller friendly market, uh, we generally have a very short period uh, to close and to uh, obtain the. The, the, the various regulatory clearances, but we've seen that seller uh, can accept to have to extend this period um, to uh, cover uh, any um, uh, extension of the review period by regulatory authorities caused by COVID. Um, and in that case, uh, the seller will, will nevertheless, at least it, it's my experience, they will nevertheless uh, ask for a ticking fee that may not be as high as the ticking fee uh, they will request for other reasons, uh, because it's, it doesn't depend on the, uh, the purchaser, but given the, the cash, the cash gener generation of uh, certain assets, uh, they will still want to uh, to uh, to get um, an interest on that. So that's uh, the the first thing that I would mention, and we can discuss a little bit uh, about uh, regulatory clearances uh, on uh, on the next slide. And the second one um, that we've seen is uh, the negotiation of the interim covenant between signing and closing. And the fact that uh, one of the very few uh, covenants that the seller agrees to give uh, is the fact that it will run uh, the business in the ordinary course, uh, but uh, the seller have then now to, uh, to ask for exceptions. Either they say that uh, they will only use their reasonable best efforts to um, provide uh, this, uh, this covenant, uh, which is obviously less protection for the purchaser, or they will provide certain exceptions in case of emergency situations where they will be able to take action that are not in the ordinary course to preserve uh, the, the business. Um, and, um, and this is something that, uh, that we see uh, more and more. Uh, Hensi, I don't know if, uh, if you've seen the same on the, on the German market. Yeah, um, I think as it goes for the covenants, I think it's pretty much uh, the same observation. Uh, on the long stop date, I think we have uh, two developments. One, and uh, I fully concur uh, with, with your um, conclusions, but uh, we have, of course, as in a seller-friendly market, which has been around now for more than a decade, uh, we we have we have seen a lot of hello high water clauses, and uh, traditionally they were only applicable to the antitrust clearances. Um, given and we will cover it in a minute, you know that the FDI approvals are um, in, in in most of the deals we see in, involving a non-European uh, buyer um, become more and more important. And here lies the difference. Um, in terms of whether you can ask for hello high water, because whereas with antitrust, I think most of the purchasers, you know, at some point they will get comfortable that the deal is doable and they can, uh, with certain remedies, you know, they are prepared to offer um, beforehand that they can get the deal through. Um, however, on, on FDI, it's more of a, of a, of a black box. Um, not talking about CFIUS, you know, which we, I think pretty much everybody is aware of, you know, that this sometimes, you know, can just be a gambling, uh, whether you get the CFIUS approval or not, but also with the FDI approval in, especially France and Germany, which I think they take a leading role 
uh, not necessarily a positive lead role, but they are both both governments, you know, are tightening the the rules and uh, especially broadening the, the the scope of application. So, um, so it is it's not it, it it's you know something where in antitrust, you know, you are basically you never surprised, you know, you're surprised of certain of the requests, you know, which come from the authorities, but you typically can pretty much foresee where you have to file. Whether you have to file, whether this you know, and 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 determine it at the time of the signing. Whereas FDI, um, sometimes you know, it turns out that the government, you know, for whatever reason, you know, they ask for covenants which you wouldn't expect, and uh, there is no way to challenge these covenants if you undertakings you need to enter. And um, so there is far more uh, room to in terms of far more room for flexibility required by also by the purchaser, and that. Ties into the in the in, in the question of whether they are prepared to take a hell or high water approach. Um, plus, uh, and this is what was mentioned before, the extension of the long stop date uh, for COVID reasons is something which uh, uh, I think some a year ago never nobody had thought you know that you would allow a purchaser to extend that that period. However, uh, given that some governments, you know, there's a, and we experienced it in the daily business, not only FDI related, that governments are simply shut down. You know, you can't find, you can't talk to any handling your case. So you change email, you can answer. And that processes, and you're not just talking France and Germany, if you have for foreign jurisdictions, it, you know, in some jurisdictions, it's, it's, it's far more worse. So that is certainly a new trend. And, um, I think it also requires far more flexibility uh, on on the sell side in terms of transaction certainty that you have to you have to buy into a certain risk, uh, which really stems from the COVID crisis. Um, that's pretty much what I can add from what you said. Thank you, Hansi. And uh, indeed, uh, we discussed uh, uh, already a little bit the, the issue of FDI that is on the next slide. Um, and that is a, a, a trend um, that is really worth noting uh, and that has been amplified by, by the COVID, clearly. Uh, all the states, uh, whether in Europe or uh, elsewhere, are reinforcing uh, their rules on, uh, on FDI uh, to protect uh, the assets, either the assets that have been negatively impacted by COVID, but also the ones like in healthcare or biotech that have been positively impacted, but are, that, that are still small and that don't want to be, the, the state want to preserve these strategic assets uh, and, uh, and they don't want to be, quote, stolen by, uh, by uh, other uh, uh, foreign states or, or, or foreign state-backed uh, um, uh, firms with, with, uh, with a lot of money. Uh, so we've seen that uh, in Europe and, uh, and especially in, in France uh, and uh, in Germany. And there is some kind of like, it's like a race basically of uh, like a, um, uh, and a competition between, between the states uh, for the one we have the, which we have the, the titles uh, roles. And, uh, and, uh, and what we've seen um, is that uh, the processes are uh, much longer uh, you need to uh, prep uh, very well in advance. Uh, there are uh, more and more undertakings um, and, uh, and uh, the purchasers need to be prepared to, uh, to, to, to give these undertakings. And uh, it, it requires a lot of education uh, from, uh, uh, I think, from the advisors. Uh, and uh, you have to think ahead uh, about uh, the, the, when you're a foreign um, uh, sponsor about the process to purchase an asset and, uh, uh, and also the angle that you have, how you will present yourself to the authorities and whether you will be in competition with other players that don't have the same um, uh, issue because they're French, for example, like I'm turning to Henri and Edouard uh, in France, you don't have this issue, but you can have it in, uh, in other jurisdictions. Uh, but you have also to think ahead about the sale process uh, because uh, at least in France, um, what you see is that the authorities are quite uh, friendly with P sponsors because generally a P 
does not have synergy. They are not trying to merge assets with uh, or to move um, <laughs> assets from France to another country. It's really a question of growth and external growth. And they have a lot of money to invest. So generally, they like sponsors. But you have to think about the exit. And if you want to sell to a strategic, uh, you may have an, a foreign strategic. You may have issue in the in, uh, in strategic sector and you see it with uh, Photonis, uh, where uh, the sale has been blocked uh, by, the, by the state. And it's one of the first time, uh, even I think the first time, uh, where uh, the state decided that um, they didn't want the, the asset to be bought by a, by a US strategic player, basically. And so uh, Ardian has to change his strategy and to, uh, to sell to a French uh, P sponsor for obviously a, a price that was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, uh, my take on, on that, I think I fully agree with uh, with, with Florence. Uh, I think that on, on certain assets and, and um, subsector, um, I don't know the example of Photonis, but if you take you know uh, healthcare or or high tech uh, company, um, it, there is a bit an important merit uh, of uh, anticipating the discussion with uh, the authorities. Uh, at different level, uh, it's, it's it's true in France, for sure, and and I think that we don't. I mean, I think that the, the private equity sponsor should not be shy in sharing and communicating a bit more uh, to the administration and to the authorities about what they intend to do because I mean, because what you're saying, Florence, is true that um, there is there is a, a view from the authorities. It, it, the, the initial view is positive around private equity, so so you always. You know the reception is always good. You know when you're asking for a meeting, when you're asking to to discuss something, when you're asking for help, especially in in, in the current administration, under the current administration in France, you receive the help. And uh, so I think it's 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 good to have um, to anticipate those discussions. But I think it's true in France, but it's true elsewhere. And you know, for instance, and in and it's linked to the COVID, but it's not only only linked to the COVID. I think you know the administration are uh, more and more under scrutiny from the citizens. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the citizens are asking more and more about protection. And you know, and maybe NC, you know that better than I do. But you know, it's it's coming link. But also, uh, for instance, we know uh, after the Wirecard uh, scandal, the Baffin, for instance, in Germany, so the the, the payment regulator is, is under scrutiny, right? So we know that today, um, you know, they are they are they are taking much more time in assessing, you know, a transaction and giving, uh, you know, their approval for a transaction. Uh, and it's one example. Baffin is one example. Uh, the, the French one is one example. For me, the conclusion to that and, and, uh, is that you need to have the best local advisor in order to manage this. So you need to have a flow. You need to have an MC in Germany because, because you need to, you know, you, you need to understand, uh, you know, how those administration work. Uh, and so I would say that it's even more important than before to have the best local advisor. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. It's true. Huh? Okay. I think there's one point, you know, and uh, this is uh, which probably one should be aware of. Uh, the, the trend in the European, most of the European member states in the meantime, towards the restrictive um, FDI regime and uh, all the bells and whistles attached to it is, of course, a personally very unfortunate. It is understood, you know, that there is a certain desire to protect each and every country's economy. But of course, uh, it is counterintuitive to the notion of the free movement of goods and the notion of free movement of capital. And um, the EU treaty, you know, foresees just the opposite. You know, it says the rules, you know, that there's a free, free movement of capital, free investment, and that also means, you know, from outside of Europe. And um, I think that has been the parad paradigm for many, many years. And it really started uh, shifting as from two, 2008 onwards, you know, when, uh, when the financial crisis started and it got even worse now, the COVID crisis. And here we have, we have, do have quite some uh, legal arguments, you know, in terms of, you know, how far it can be taken, especially uh, that the rules, you know, you can only, uh, put prohibitions, you know, on, 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 on transactions, you know, if the public order and security is severely affected, 
And so that test, you know, is a really te test introduced by the European Court of Justice. And um, in the, our personal view is, you know, that that test, you know, fails in many, many instances, you know, which are now uh, run by uh, the, 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 the be it in, in, in France, be it in, in Italy. And also, though uh, Britain is not any longer a part of the EU, they also Britain, you know, is just about to introduce a regime, you know, which is even se more severe than a German one. And I think that tells, tells us a story. So, um, and uh, maneuvering to this jungle, and uh, that is true, you know, you need to be uh, at good terms with the government. You need to understand, you know, how they tick, as we say, and um, and, and, and that uh, and, and to handle it properly. And the and the results. That's good news, I think. For the uh, the good news is, you know, you can you can do the deals, but you know, it just takes more time uh, to prepare them. The deals become more and more front loaded and back loaded. I think that's what we notice here. In, in order to to have it to steer deals through, you know, there's some far more work required both on the client side and on the advisor side. In order, you know, to secure transaction security at the end of the day and uh, and be uh, and, and and spare us of bad surprises. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Hensi. Uh, so maybe uh, a couple of uh, of minutes before the question, moving to the next slides, we can uh, say a few words about uh, financing term. And uh, Henri, you may want to give us. Uh, uh, some uh, insight on the on on the mm -hmm. financing market and financing terms in general. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, but like equity uh, debt debt uh, financing is abundant huh, these days, and uh, even more than eighteen months or twelve months ago, uh, debt and financing is almost a commodity these days. That's why we've seen on many occasions full underwritings uh, of from, from sponsors on on, on assets to preempt and move very fast. And then uh, when it's, co it's coming to, to structure the financing, maybe two, two remarks. The first one being, we clearly see a comeback of banks uh, versus unit tranche funds, uh, notably on larger deals. And uh, it's, it's clearly a trend. Uh, we see it at Apex uh, quite uh, more than before uh, uh, these days. A second point maybe that is new is that everybody has, still has the, the scars of the beginning of the crisis uh, and there is now a very strong emphasis on liquidity clauses. And I think sponsors these days are more and more uh, negotiating very large RCFs, uh, capacity to pick interest, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in order to make sure that the business will not be uh, under liquidity stress, uh, if, the, if the crisis uh, comes back, um, I think also in terms of the uh, terms in general, we are almost back to uh, 2007 in terms of leverage, but also in terms of uh, overall financing terms, be it uh, covenants, if any. Uh, we even price uh, deals with no covenants notably uh, when it's uh, syndicated or, or underwritten by banks. Uh, and we see also the comeback of uh, clauses like uh, ABDA cures, cures uh, with almost no limits, et cetera. Uh, it is good for us these days. <laughs> Will it last? I don't know. Uh, but these days, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's how it works because, because of the ample liquidity we see in the market. Uh, people still need to deploy, notably on quality uh, assets. I don't know, Edouard, if you have uh, the same experience. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, we, we are sharing the same experience. Um, we'll see how long it lasts. I mean, it's even the amount of liquidity uh, in the world, uh, you know, there is no reason, of course, you know, the, but what will happen in the interest rates will be important. But uh, right. But in the foreseeable future, we, we don't see a lot of pressure from coming from the financing market. That's it. I agree. Uh, and maybe one quick word to uh, to to end this presentation on uh, this French uh, specificity of the French state uh, back loans. Just to say uh, that uh, we're seeing targets where uh, this uh, what we call PGE. Uh, have been put in place, uh, and this is something that we need to take into account in the structuring of the deal, uh, whether we want to keep them or, or not, or refinance them. 
Uh, and uh, what we were um, saying when preparing, uh, among ourselves, when preparing this session with uh, Henri was that, uh, in fact, it's one category, but uh, with very different terms, because what we say is just that it's guaranteed by the state, but it can be a very small, but after that, it's really a question of negotiation with the banks. Uh, and uh, you can have very different terms from one to the other, uh, whether it's a very small one at the level of a subsidiary, whether it's a large one that has a major impact on the, on, on the viability uh, and the liquidity uh, of um, the cash liquidity of the, of the target. So it really depends on the situation. 